Today I am travelling to the historic city of Nijmegen, which is considered the oldest city in the Netherlands, dating back to the first century BC. But I'm not investigating history today, instead we are looking at the future. I've always been interested in new technology and the uses of artificial intelligence, but with a non-tech background, the team at machine to learn tasked me with the challenge of finding out more about AI with an aim to reduce its apparent technical complexity. The result of my research culminated in two interviews with professors of AI working at the Radboud University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. In my second interview in the series, I enjoyed speaking with Tom Heskes, a professor of artificial intelligence and the director for education for computing and information science at the university. Tom is specifically interested in causal discovery and Bayesian machine learning. In other words, how to disentangle cause and effect from big data and how that can be used further within the processes of machine learning. <laughs> um, big data is an interesting start, really. Um, Judy Pearl, in his book, in his tome here of uh, The Book of Why, talks about data as a glorious ocean of ones and zeros. So if actually interpreting data means hypothesizing about how things work in the real world, how do we extract meaning from numbers, bits and pixels um, without getting too bound up in complicated math? Wow, that's a good question and a difficult one to start with. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think you cannot get meaning just from bits, pixels without having any prior knowledge, right? So you have to put in some, some kind of background knowledge. And depending on how much knowledge you already have, you can start at one place or you can start at the other place. So when we do causal discovery, we have to make some assumptions. You cannot do any statistics or machine learning without making assumptions, either explicitly or implicitly. Um, but we let the data speak for as much as we can. So that's really, um, I would say, a bit special about causal discovery that we try to limit the assumptions that we're trying to make and still try to find cause and effect relationships there. Um, ba basically from the zeros and the ones and the pixels and the bits. Okay. Um, which is complicated, but in some cases it, it is doable. You could explain a little bit more about neural networks and computing power and data sets. Um, you, for example, uh, in the, um, the meetup that you held in Amsterdam, you, you said that machine learning alone is not going to bring us really intelligent machines. Causality will bring us closer. Oh, did I? <laughs> yes, you did. Okay, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're regretting that now. I no, just no, no, wondered I if you could explain no, your point I, of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, right? So there is um, um, there was deep learning, which which really gave a boost to to uh, machine learning and to artificial intelligence. Um, and and the boost is such that some people might now think that deep learning is kind of the answer and and it's the whole of of artificial intelligence. But th there was so much more than that. Um, but deep learning really made, it, made a huge impact uh, for, for tasks like speech, um, uh, computer vision, a bit of text analysis. Uh, but there were so many other problems that deep learning doesn't really help, right? So, 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 so that's one issue. So we shouldn't focus just on deep learning. And, um, and I don't think that deep learning will solve all, all the problems that we still have. Um, and so some people say that, well, we now have deep learning and we, sh we sh just should go on on this path and then deep learning will help to solve the rest of the problems? Um, I don't think so. I think deep learning is pretty good for, for this specific type of problem, but we also need completely different paradigms. The, the ones that we don't know yet and that we, that we really don't have yet. So deep learning is really uh, still about input, output, and trying to fit a model in between, right? So we have input examples, we have output, um, we have the outputs that, that correspond to these input samples and then well, we try to learn a model, um, which is perfectly fine. And for many applications, it's what you would like to have. So think about face tagging or uh, speech recognition. Or, but to really understand what's going on, you, you, you need something more than that. And causal discovery is at least one paradigm of, or causal inference where we try to understand a bit better what, what the world is really about so that we can also do interventions, that we, we can think about new policies and things like that. So that's not within the paradigm of deep learning. So we need something else for that. OK. So in other words, um, you believe causality will bring us closer to strong AI 
in that sense that that it'll actually give us more value than perhaps the the narrower field of of machine deep learning yeah i would think so so i th i think if we want to go in the direction of strong ai we definitely need the concept of causality in there uh, but there is so much more that we need to go towards strong ai so in um in my more popular scientific talks then um I always ask the public, so how long do you think it will take uh, before we, we, um, we, we get this strong AI or mm -hmm. artificial general intelligence? And then they always say, well, the, the somewhere between 10 and 30 years is what most people think, but I think it will take it much longer. And um, there were so many concepts that we still don't understand, right. like conscience, um, but, uh, but also really how to implement causality into machine learning algorithms. Um, there is so much context that we have, um, we don't know how to put it into okay. machine learning algorithms as of yet. Um, but that's what you're working on. I well, I'll yeah, that's what we're yeah. trying to do, right? So, <laughs> yeah. and, and of course, I mean, you ca as, as a researcher, you cannot work on all these different paradigms mm. and all these different um, areas of research there are. Um, so so we we're, we're now focusing on, on causal discovery and on causality and trying to Okay. Try to make our so if you work. were to make a punt as to how many years yourself that it would take really to at least 100 at least 100 yeah uh -huh. and okay. and probably much not more not in than our that. lifetimes then not in my lifetime <laughs> <laughs> okay um i just I, I have brought us some shakers because i thought it was quite interesting i mean um whether you know the probability of throwing a six um, is, oh, okay. is the same each time you throw it. There's a few. There's a few in there. I think it makes it a bit more complicated. Maybe just start with one. Um, but uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. So um, I just wanted to try and work out the difference between Bayesian theory and probability. So if we started with shaking and seeing that ev the probability of throwing a six is the same each time you shake. Okay. Yeah. But uh, oh, I got a two. Oh, you got a two. Well, I, I can try. You can try. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm well better done. <laughs> You're better than that. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> um, yeah it's just that um, you, you mentioned in our discussion that you know people are not really that great about ca calculating probability. No. I mean, um, you know, as a child doing that, they probably think that um, um, that, that you know the chance of throwing a six each time is is not the same every time they shake no. it. And but um, I think that's quite interesting. Um, um, something that was also in the book of why. Um, was the Monty, what, what was called the Monty Hall paradox uh, from a game show in the States. Yep. Um, it was called Let's Make a Deal and it ran in the 1990s. Uh, and contestants were given the choice to win, you know, the ability to win a car. They basically had to just open the right door. And behind two doors were goats and behind the other door was the car. a car. So, uh, so say uh, you're given the choice uh, to pick a door uh, and say you, you cho choose door one. And the host, um, he knows what's behind the doors, of course, uh, opens a different door, say door three, um, and he shows you a goat. And so he then asks you if you want to change your mind and pick the, the last door, i.e. door two. Um, what's the right decision then, to stick to door one or to choose door two instead? So you have to switch. You have to switch. Well, you have to switch in terms of, of probability calculus. It so just seems counterintuitive. Yeah, so, so for many people it does, right? Because there are still these two door left, so, and you don't know which one the goat will be behind and which one the car will be behind. But you did get additional information, namely that the car is not behind door C in this case, probably where, where the, 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 the quiz master showed the goat. So that gives you additional information. By using Bayes' rule, you can compute that it actually makes a difference. So that the probability that now, given this additional information, the, the car is behind door B is, is bigger than it was before. Okay. And it's counterintuitive, and even to, to the best mathematicians, it, it, they, well, they, they really didn't get this, and then, well, you, you can do the experiments even, and in in, indeed throw, throwing dice or whatever, um, and then you will find it out that it's indeed the case that you better switch, because the probability if, if the quiz master doesn't do really weird stuff, then the probability goes from, um, I think, one third to 
two third or whatever or half to <laughs> two third. I, I don't care, but it definitely increases. Yeah. The yeah. chances are that you so, win so, the so car. Even I, I, I cannot do the calculations by <laughs> heart. I, I would okay. really need to write it on paper. But you know enough to the, to decide that you might win the car, whereas I probably would get. Yeah, the but votes probably so. if you would put me at the <laughs> show, I I also wouldn't write on the spot be able to decide about yeah. upon that, right? So. And for me, that's a re that, that tells us that we need computers to actually do this. And we mm. have to try to implement these kind of calculations into computers because we as humans, we are not good we, at we that. We're not good at that, no. No. Okay, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so, um, you, for example, um, you said the understanding of causal relationships um, has, allows us to rethink the domains we're working in. Um, you did some research on ADHD, for example. Okay, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, so um, so we used to work a lot with, um, and, and we're still working quite a lot with people from, from the, the Robert UMC, from the Academic Hospital. Yeah. Um, so, so they have lots of databases uh, with questionnaires, with neuroimaging experiments, with genetic information, with whatever. Um, and then they basically hand them over and say, well, can you make any chocolate out of this, basically? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, then we try. And, and I think in this domain, uh, causal modeling is really useful because if you then can find kind of cause-effect relationship, they, they can suggest you therapies or, or um, where you should start looking for, for new experiments or whatever. And so, um, so we got these data sets and in fact quite a lot and, and on different types of populations and, and well, uh, from, from different studies. And in, in these different studies we always f found applying pretty standard causal, causal discovery algorithms the, the causal link between inattention and hyperactivity. So ADHD, it stands for attention deficit um, hyperactivity disorder, disorder yeah. probably, right? So yeah. the D for disorder. Yeah. Um, and so, so, but people don't really know what, what the, m the main driver of the disease is, right? And um, so, but then what we find basically simply by looking at the data is that it suggests that, that there is this causal link from inattention to hyperactivity. So that inattention is more the driver of the hyperactivity than the other way around. Okay. And so that means to us that, well, maybe two things. and that. The first thing is that if you're going to design new experiments, right, like randomized control trials, then maybe you should try and focus on the inattention more than on the hyperactivity. And you could try and validate what we found by just looking at the data. So you can set up your experiments to try and validate that. And if it then happens to be correct, if well, we, we, we were pointing in the right uh, direction or, or the data was basically pointing in that direction, um, then you can start thinking of new therapies and you then you would really like to focus on on inattention on trying to reduce the 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 inattention um, problems that that children have because then hopefully that will also improve um, the issues that they have with hyper with hyperactivity whereas the other way around will probably not work I wanted to talk a little bit about biases um, sort of there's a, a cognitive bias codex here um, um, of which, yeah, there are over 200 human biases, incredibly enough, and I don't think that's yeah. all of them, actually. There's oh, been oh, more research there more since. Way, so. I think there are even more. So wow. um, it's a fantastic chart. Um, so on, on here, it, it says, we project our current mindset and assumptions onto the past and future. Um, there was a recent article by Yale Eisenstadt, who he explained how humans are so biased. And it's, even if you're aware of bias, it's almost impossible to eliminate it in your work. Um, yeah. And I just w wondered if Bayesian theories could help us here to gain a better understanding of related variables around bias. Yeah, um, probably. The, the people tend to complain a lot that algorithms are biased, right? Yes. Well, maybe. So for me, it's more that the data that al the algorithms are based on are biased, and then the models that we build from the these data are, are also biased, and then the decisions that we make from these models are then also biased. So that, that's for sure. So I, I fully understand that. I think what's really nice is that, um, and that's the whole field of fair machine learning that kind of works on that, is that we can try to de-bias the, the algorithms, right? So we can somehow regularize them um, such that they become less biased, in fact, in fact. So we can get rid of some of the biases that are in the data. Um, 
by, by building better algorithms, basically. And we could try and do the same as humans, and in fact, we do that, right? We try to teach them, and, and, well, um, and it works to, to some extent, hopefully. But with algorithms, we can essentially do the same, and it might even work a bit better. Yeah, yeah. it's about being aware, isn't it? Awareness, really, of, of, of the inherent biases that we, that we have, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to to give a concrete example, so um, so it's, so the way that people talk about this is that you have to think about the protected variables like gender or race or and um, and, and and if you decide that they that these have to be protected, that you then you can make sure somehow that the machine learning algorithm is fair with respect to these variables. And it's more complicated that you and uh, it's a bit more complicated than you think, right? So. Uh, so, so some people thought in the beginning that then in your model you should not include that variable, but it's not like that. Right? So, um, so you have to include the variable because you can use it to compensate for some of the other correlations that you that you might find between some of the other variables, um, and that brings us back a bit again to cause and effect. So, I think the the most uh, promising framework that is around for fair machine learning is uh, so-called counterfactual fairness. And that's based on kind of reasoning about counterfactuals. So what if this particular person uh, was not a man, was, but was in fact a woman? W would you then uh, act in the same way or, or also not give this insurance? Or, or would you hire him or her? Or so, so those kind of reasonings. So we call that counterfactual reasoning. And that's, uh, well, I think uh, level three or something in, in, in uh, Julia Pearl's book, right? <laughs> okay. so, um, so that brings it back to the book again. It brings so I think it back to the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in that sense, um, I think there is a lot that causality can, can bring in there as well. So, so you have to think about those type of, of questions, um, which forces it to think within this causality framework. Okay. So kind of Maybe what Maybe not taking everything yeah. at face value then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, you, you're an expert in your field. There's probably questions I haven't asked you. Would there, would there have been something that you'd have liked me to ask or expected me to ask that I haven't yet asked you? Um, yeah, we, so, so we have touched upon it even, even though we probably weren't sure, is, is explainability, right? So that's a hot topic in, in artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, and it's a concern that, that many people have that the black mo box models that we currently have are, are too difficult, too complicated, and as humans we really don't understand um, 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 what's going on inside these black boxes. And I think people are right, we, we don't really know, right? And there were two reasons for that. One reason is that the world is complex, and um, so it's just complicated. And then if you want to have the best models, you need complicated models for that. So that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is that we, we are still working really hard on trying to, to make, on top of these complicated models that we have, uh, to try to build kind of high-level high algorithms or models to try and explain what these models are actually doing. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's a field that's also very important. So those are the two fields that I'm, I'm really interested in. So one is kind of the fair machine learning, the other one is the, is the explainability. So how can, even if we build very complex models, we can still present them in a way such that humans can understand what, what the outcome of the models is and, and um, why they, they, um, they, the outcome of these models in terms of the, the decisions that they lead to. Right? And that's again, for me, a bit of the, the, the why question. So if we manage to understand kind of the why questions even inside of these models, then it will definitely help is also to, um, to improve the models and to make them better understandable f for humans and al then also that the decisions that come out of these models are easier to accept for humans. Okay. Um, well, actually, that leads back to our discussion on, on, on why we don't do anything towards climate change in a sense that actually maybe the why hasn't been explained enough. The exp there isn't enough explanation about, behind it for, 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 for most people. Yeah, I guess so. And... and um, um, and when, when I followed the, the discussions a bit between, between the, the two camps, you could say, um, I think it's still too fussy in a sense, right? And, and, um, and it, it's, so to me, it's really frustrating that um, 
um, you seem to be a believer if you're in one camp or you are in, uh, a believer if you're in the other camp. So it's really about beliefs yeah. and not well, so much about nice. data and, and about, um, hmm. um, about truth in, in, in some sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, which is a pity. So we need to have more data, better models, and then hopefully we can sort that out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Heskes, thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. You're <laughs>